my first question is, when did you join the Marines? Like, what year? 43. 1943. How old were you when you joined the Marines? I was, uh, just turned 18. Uh, I just graduated from high school, and back then, the, the war had been in just a, just a little over a year, you know. Yeah. So, when Jap was 41, when they, December of 41 is when they bombed Pearl Harbor, you know. And 42 would be the full year, and then uh, the, uh, as soon as the high school went out, it must have been May, June, let's see. May or June, I don't know which. I forget now. Or I was telling him, I don't, my memory's not too good. Anyway, he was drafting everybody, see. So uh, <clears throat> when I went in, I told him I wanted to join the Marines, and they turned a lot of different ones down in front of me. They didn't think they were good health that I was, a real good shape. So they, yeah, you heard of who we're looking for. So that I, they, they let me win the Marine Corps, see. What did you do exactly? You were your position. Well, since I uh, in the Marine Corps, they sent me to uh, Paris Island. That's a boot camp. You go down there for 16 weeks of special training. Learn how to march and and do all kind of things and uh, have a school. And that's that's where. I learned how to, uh, uh, what I got into was radio. They took and they had a person there that's sending code, you know, Morse code. They go, did da, dit, dit, small, a dot, and a da, make a little splash. So I, I put that down. And they, they sent a good bit of it, and evidently I was putting it down about the way they, Expect uh, somebody real good at it, and uh, they said uh, you're going to go to radio school. They sent me up to uh, uh, North Carolina. I was talking about the there, and I went up there and went to radio school. When that shame, I can't. I thought I'd tell him. I can't think of it. Uh, you're on the news all the time. That's where Can't Second Division is. Camp of June, right? Camp of June, yeah. Camp of June, there. Yeah. And I went to radio school. And I was checked out as a top radio man. 25 words a minute, five letter code groups. Wow. Pencil with a pencil. So I went to that radio school. And uh, they, they, they needed somebody up in Navy Department, D.C. That's the biggest radio station in the world there. And I went up there and and uh, there in the, when I checked out of that place, I, like I say, I, I the top's in, the, in there, and that's why they sent me up there. But anyway, as soon as I went in there, I, I sat down and all of a ship to sea had this copy, what they called uh, uh, NNS Washington. You had to copy what they sent because you don't know whether it's coded with you a message for you or what. So you copied it. If it wasn't for you, you didn't have to worry about it. See, we had message center places. They would uh, uh, check and break it down and see what the message was about. See. But I worked on two or three different things there, and I'd, one was on there. I was on Bermuda, San Diego. Uh, and uh, one place over in the, close to, uh, you've been down there south of Florida. Miami? No, on down. Key West? No, uh, where you had a, you had a, uh, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, yeah. Places like that all around the state and up along the coast, I, I can't remember them now. And they was on there, but I just send the code messages to them. They'd bring me something, I'd send it, and I had to copy it. If it was coming in there, anything coming in, in the 
and as I swore and started, did it, did it, did it, did it, did see, that's the way it was. And as that swooshing was the way that what theirs was. Did you have any Navajo code talkers with you? I had two of them, yeah. They come to me there on the side pan, and uh, Billy, the, the big shot sent them there and let me know that they, they was there. And they told me what they was going to be doing, and I can't remember a whole lot. And uh, I just put them down as, as what they were going to be doing, you know. I was ahead one there on that thing. And uh, they were there uh, on side pen, and of course, wherever we went, they would, that's what they did. They just had their code of their own, you know. Their talk, nobody could understand that. The Japanese, they tried to mess us up all the time. Come in and, and sometimes I'd have to change the channel. They get on there and make so much noise and talking on it and feel like that, like that, and talk to So I just put it down there a few times to go to the station so and so, give them the code number, and we'd move to that and everything would be all right. And, uh, so, uh, and that's all we had to do. Sometimes nights you'd have about three different uh, code stations come in on you. Different. Sometimes you'd have to copy the weakest one. I said well, that's why I probably lost this ear on the left side. Because I'd have to, one I need, had to do it, they'd give you their number, what station it was and where it was coming from. So I'd have to go to it, and them other two might be a little louder than it, and I had to bring it up to where I could hear it. That's hard to do, you know. You've got two is bad enough, but sometimes I'd hear three. We little tiny anybody back, or, you know, they're coming from different places. And so uh, that's, that's what we had to do. There in his training there at D.C., Back to a guy like me so well, he said, when you get out of the Marine Corps, you come back here. He said, I'll give you a job here. He said, we can use guys. Like, he's from Pennsylvania. He liked me. He used to go out on the Potomac River with him on a uh, little boat. He had some kids. And we'd go out there. And, but I could uh, just do two or three of the different uh, systems they had in there. That biggest radio station in the world that had different things, you know. And I, had, I learned to do a couple of three and then got thought I was going to be using in ordinary use like the South Pacific and the division and so on. Then I went, after I think six months I was there at that special training in the Navy Department in D.C. Then I went back the camp of June, because that's where the second division's been. I was in it the whole time, see. And uh, then we took off by train throughout to the southwest through Texas. I think two days we was on that train, an old train out they had hauled animals on. It had the worst train you ever on. And didn't travel too fast. It took us over two days. We went clear into California. And uh, trying to think of this, the the. Uh, uh, see, that's why I, I had hesitating. What the heck was the place that we went to there? It was all was just something like old sheds built, like they hadn't built up yet. Now it's a real nice big place. The one in L.A.? Next to Los Angeles. Pendleton? Pendle Camp Pendleton, yeah. See, I, I can't remember that. So we went there and we got ready. And they took us uh, down to L.A. and got on the ship and headed for Saipan. So they went through, uh, went through, uh, How are you? We seen all them ships stand on in, load up, dozens of them sitting there where the Japs come in there and 
just dug a whole bunch of them up in there, see. So we uh, <clears throat> we went uh, on a uh, I used to know the name of the ship and everything. Sometimes my mind not as good as it is other times. I usually could never always remember that name of that ship, but anyway, it was another country ship, wasn't one of ours. They only had one meal a day, and uh, that would be at a supper time. And that was in 44 when we was going over there. And uh, Thanksgiving, they fixed turkey. And everybody, but they ate any of that turkey, and about everybody did, because everybody was hungry if you had one meal a day. And uh, you got cocaine poisoning every place. Everybody on was sick. And uh, you know, we got in rough waters, and and uh, water was splashing out of the, the commodes and stuff on the floor. You know, I never even went down for three or four days. I let, got up on the ship, it was warm weather, and got over where I could get over to the side and vomit. And everybody was laying, some of them passed out, to the place where they had uh, normally to take somebody was sick, was full. Some of them were still downstairs in their bed. I think it was nearly 2,500 or 3,000 on that ship. And everybody that ate that turkey got domain poison. You know what I mean. I think that's what they call it. Yeah, that's what you always call it. Anyway, when uh, we got to Japan, they looked at me and said, Where in the world you guys come from? Where you been? And I told them they thought we'd come out of a bad battle somewhere where we didn't have no food. We just skinny looking and it takes about uh, I think we was on the water from that time of sick and I, we just are starting to get you know a little better when we went in that island of Saipan. And the first night they were shooting the ships down here come a plane thought it was coming in and they said they told us to come on, let's get in the foxhole. We made a run for it get in the foxholes so we know whether we'd be trying to shoot to or fly into us or what. I ran that foxhole and tore me out of my pants. <laughs> but uh, they couldn't believe it. What we told them about being sick from eating. Oh, that turkey, that everybody was sick and some of them, I don't know whether any of them died or not. I'm really done. It was that bad. <clears throat> so I was there on Saipan, and there's still a lot of Japanese on there. About every month, once a month, they'd form a across the island. There's only four by seven miles wagon. So there's a big B-29 field on there, biggest plane that they had back then that was. And uh, <clears throat> we was uh, watching take care of it. We lived in little old tents on a uh, right close to it. And when ships go up to Saipan and bomb them up there and come back, some of them had a wing that would be shot off and uh, they'd, la they'd land the ones that's going to be troublesome like that right out in the water. We'd send boats out and they'd try to save the guys that would find them. Cause they couldn't, there was a small field, just them big old thing that just get off and they'd drop down you couldn't even see them. And they just skip in the water and everything, and they start to rage, and it's loaded with bombs, you know. <clears throat> and uh, we were the closest troops, really, right that time to Japan, them islands was. <clears throat> but uh, like I started to say, they just form a uh, cross there, there's only that, the wide of a place. They just take some troops and go and quiet, and they'd get maybe 25 or 30 jets about every time they done it. They had the foxholes. Me, uh, me and my friend went over to a place where we could buy, where they had ice cream. The only place I ever had anything like it cold the whole time I was there. There's a, a Navy outfit. You could go over there and get, 
and they give you ice cream. We was coming back, and me and this fellow, we short cut through the wood. He was loud mouth. He was from the same town as me, a horse Wilmer and Charlie Wilmer. And, uh, he was in the, one of the battalions. And he'd come over there. Uh, I got two beers every week, and he'd come over there to get them two beers because I never drank. <laughs> anyway, we were making noise, and we got down through there, and there was a little pot where there was heat and water, and they must have went into one of the caves in there, see. So that's the way it was the whole time we was there. Then I don't know how many, it must have, we then I guess it was the next place we went, which went all, uh, D Day on Okinawa. That's when we went up there. We were one of the closest. We were not too far from Okinawa from where we was there. And, uh, we went up there, and like I was telling her, Adam and her old better go. They wrecked, flew into, one of them flew into a ship, a Navy ship, and killed over, I think it was six sailors. And we lost to bury them at sea. And a lot of fighting, you know, you'd see planes coming in, that coming in from uh, Kanoya, Japan. That's where they was flying from. And uh, they just put a big thousand pound bomb on them. They made a, they wasn't going to come back. They were going to fly into a ship, so yeah. They just had enough gas in them to get down there. And they'd fly into our ships. We had about 400 that got hit from them boats. You know, and so that's why we went back because we didn't want our if that hit our ship our ship there with us in it. They could have blown it up, and we'd all lost our lives. A lot of us would. But I didn't close enough to the ground. We could have maybe swum in some of us. But anyway, uh, they decided to go back to Saipan, and uh, we got back there, and then they come to me and. The fight had been got, got real bad up there, so they wanted to send a, uh, two of our battalions, about four basically battalions in a division, uh, and they come to me and says, uh, "You get yourself about, I think it was six or eight radio men, and uh, you're going to go back up. Uh, they need uh, radio men on for the Marine airstrip, and the Sixth Army needs." Some radio men, and we took care of their messages after we got up there. And uh, that's when we didn't go on to Okinawa; we went north of it. That was closer. Was between uh, Okinawa and Japan. We closest troops to Japan at that time. And uh, I was a radio man telling the he was a general or something. I was, uh, we had code for every island, for every place. And I say so and so's okay, and this little country part where we was checking on, uh, they found out there wasn't any Japanese army there, so we took our we went in there at those uh, LCI. They had tanks and and mostly ones that was going to be hitting the beach to win. <clears throat> so we went in and we didn't have no opposition whatsoever. And we set up our big radio truck there and, and had it right in a place there, uh, just along the edge of the ocean, you know. And uh, we uh, sat there till they sort of. Uh, things got better where they uh, whipped the well, Japs was on Okinawa, and they got us, and we went back to Saipan. When we got back there, the whole division was ready to come back, and we was going to head into Japan. The war hadn't ended yet. And uh, at that time, they dropped the atomic bomb there in Nagasaki in Japan. And we went straight up there and went into that. That's where we was going to go anyway. And we went into that southern uh, part of Japan where Nagasaki was. And uh, 
we see in Howard Rose all level where they dropped the atomic bomb. Second atomic bomb there, see. And the uh, place right up begin the bank, we got down on the harbor, and I got my radio men in there, and that's where we uh, set up a radio system. And uh, we was there, I don't know, a couple, three months or so. And we started going over to different places. Sasebo. Uh, that's funny, there were three or four main big places that we went to there. We sort of secured that whole lower part of the span, see. There was an army group over one, one part of us doing some too. <clears throat> and that's. I think it was Sasebo where I left from to head back to the United States. I think I have all that in that book if you really want to get that information more. I'm going to see if I need Dad to give it to us. Huh? I'll check with Dad about that. Yeah, you could read that part of it. I might have that all written in there, possibly. Yeah. And, uh, boy, am I, mine, I, I, I might think of something one minute, next minute I, I forgot it. Once you're 87 years old, you start doing that. So. You did a great job, Pappy. You're doing fine. Well, you can pick it out and just get an idea of where I was and what I'd done. And I didn't mention the fact I was on about four or five other uh, big ships, big uh, uh, sh ships like people go big trips on and everything just to get me where I wanted to go. And it's on them smaller ones, and uh, uh, I spent at least six or seven months on the water, going different places. So you mainly traveled by boat? Oh, that's the only thing I ever traveled in is boats. So you, I, so I was you... on destroyers, Joe, and, and what I was going to say, every boat, every ship we got on, I'd go and to the radio shack and say you need some help here because they just copied code five letter code groups everything was not like it is now but nobody knew who we, we were or what we was we had a code name for everything and I'd go and we'd uh, uh, say we'll, we'll go sit down to your, here and cop, do your copying of your codes coming in and so on that tickled them to death to give them a break that way we could go to eat with the Navy. But before, they'd say, when it's time for a meal, they'd say, chow down for ship's crew and Navy staff. All you Marines stand and clear the mess deck until pipe two. So we had to wait till last day. We blow the whistle a second time. <laughs> I told old Butch that, you know, he was a Navy boy at uh, all boat. I said, you guys, oh, we're the ones hitting the beach, and you make us wait till last beach, you know. <coughs> so you served from the time you joined till the end? Oh, I was over there that whole time, yeah. The, as soon as I joined, I was, second, I was in the second division. And I went through radio school in Camp June, went to the Navy Department for six months and got some yeah. farther time. They needed radio men over a bed. I used to sit in, and sit in, sit in radio school. There were normally got outfit come in there. That there in in, in uh, uh, main uh, uh, see I can't even think what it is now. Uh, that every every body that regardless where they was, whether on ship or what, they had to copy that. It was eighteen words a minute come out of D.C. where I was, and uh, these army guys they could only maybe do twelve or fourteen or fifteen. I'd sit down speed key and send code and get to. It's like it was in a training school for them. Yeah. And so uh, they said these guys can't even copy this. Uh, well, and that's funny, I can't think of what it had a name. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> uh, I was the best one in the second division, but nobody was sharp enough to say it would be somebody else. They usually put them right in the main. At headquarters company where all the big brass was, all the generals and everything was there. In fact, they even come to us one time there in Saipan, 
says they want to take some radios out and show these lieutenants, these colonels, how they used them. That was all new stuff back then. Some of them had some of them that you put on your back. You see them in, in things and set it up on the thick of code. And uh, you would uh, uh, show them. One of them was out about 300 yards, another one, and they were talking to each other on that thing. We had one with, with the English, you know, they could do. Yeah. In fact, the old uh, guy, the big shot in there, he says, uh, I was talking to him, and he said, where you at, Marine? I said, I'm sorry, sir, I can't tell you that. We'd never supposed to tell where we was any time. The Japanese listen in, and I'd tell them where I was. They could put, what, direct a bomb right in on your jump the shell or whatever. So it was just the way it was. Yep. He said, I understand. He called me Marine. And I said, he, he wanted to know. We, at that time, we was connecting the first time, and we were the first ones to ever do it, our outfit. We went through the, uh, the telephone system into the offices. No way ever, that, that was never done back in the Second World or that. And they told us, you're the first ones to ever do this. That's why he asked me where you was calling. I was down on the beach, and he called and wanted to know where I was. And I said, I'm sorry, sir, I can't give you much from that. So, do you remember any how to say anything specific, like in code? Huh? Like any words that you can remember in code? No, I, we didn't have anything like that. Everything was put down. Like Instead of saying a word, they had a code way to do it. Five letter code group. You'd be in a code group, five letter, and they'd take them, and we had a message center. We'd take them there and they'd decode them. And they could tell if it was for them or what it was all about, if it was coming from. Uh, or we sent it out, we sent a lot of stuff out being the headquarters company to all of the battalions. They had a radio man all the battalions, say, maybe a couple, three. Yeah. And they always protected us because of. You don't have, you know, uh, somebody that can keep in contact where all the others are doing, how they're doing. If they're in trouble, they're not going to let the headquarters know, so you'll know where to send more troops or whatever. Say. <clears throat> but that's uh, my responsibility I had. Did you earn any medals, like specific awards or anything? Well, you look in the back room back there, I have a lot of, your dad there fixed me up a box of things out of a sharpshooter. Top, I was really the top one in my, when we went to Camp of June down there. <clears throat> one guy beat me by just a little point, but the reason I lost that, guy set me up for <clears throat> 300 yards with the Gwendy. You had to, you know, he'd tell you how to move the, the wind he'd on a rifle. If it's going long distance, it's real hard wind, he'd move it a little bit. Well, he told me wrong. And I shot up about this size, and the thing was about this big, and I, he had me over, and part of it was that was the big round thing I was supposed to hit in. And all the rest, in 500 yards, I shot 36 out of uh, 40. At 500, 300 yards, I just let that old thing chop down, and boys, Shooter and everything would just be right in that big old thing about that big, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> but uh, I was second. That one guy beat me, but because that guy told me wrong on 300 yards, he, he, he said, move it. He said, you had a little thing, you move it. Uh, correct, he was shooting a long distance. You couldn't leave it the same place all day. You might have to move that just slightly. <clears throat> That was no big deal. <clears throat> but just like when I was in, in the still at home and my mother would say, can't go over and holler and get five squirrels. I'd take a twenty-two rifle and go over there and be back in a half hour. The place was li just live with squirrels. We want squirrel to eat, I, she'd tell me go and get her a squirrel. I'd come down cut them across the back pull the skin off of them and gut them and take them into her and she picked them and eat them. <laughs> Sounds tasty. I never had squirrel myself. But. Oh, squirrel's good eating, boy. And groundhog, I get them there about half grown ones. 
uh, we didn't have a lot of shelter or money to buy them. I'd get out there and I'd watch them when they'd get out about 20 or 30 foot from the hole where they was in. I'd be laying back where they didn't see me. And I'd make a run, I'd bark like a dog. And they'd just stop and, you know, and then I'd hit them in the head with a fatty candle. That way I didn't have to shoot them. And I'd skin them and take them in and eat them. <laughs> That's the way it was back then, buddy. In the 40s, early 40s. I was born in 1925, you know. I was almost back when George Lincoln was crossing the Delaware. <laughs> well, thank you. That was a lot.